All right, everybody, welcome to video, the video for section 7.7. .7. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about this concept of approximate integration. Um, so let's just go ahead and hop right into it. Um, this is the first of two lectures, which I will not be able to do in person, but I uh, will be recording um, for you to watch and kind of think over and work through on your own time um, if you have the opportunity. So, yeah, um, let's talk about why we need approximate integration. Um, well, first off, um, we need to have this concept of approximate integration because, you know, we, we went through all these different techniques, um, or will have gone through all these different techniques, including um, integration by parts and tricks, integration, trig substitution, um, partial fractions, um, to be able to do these integrals. But the issue is, is that there still are integrals, which we will have no idea how to do, which we will not be able to solve. Um, some of which, um, the book gives examples, it does from zero to one of e to the x squared, um, which no, there's no x out here. Um, there's no x squared or anything um, to make this work. It's just e to the x squared by itself. This is not a possible integral for us to do. We have no, there's no easy way to find the antiderivative of this function. We don't know what it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's defined as something, but it's not, we don't know the values or how to calculate it or really demonstrate a neat exact um, answer. And so this and many others are kind of in this realm where, okay, we have all these methods, but these are still, this and others are still outside of our reach. Like, you can't do anything with them, but there's still real situations where we have to, might want to use these or know what happens with them. Um, it also happens um, that, you know, we may not have the function that represents a curve, right? So I may just be given, you know, let's say I have a graph and I may just be given individual points, but I have, I have no idea how these points are all connected together. And so if I'm talking about, you know, what an area looks like underneath this graph, uh, I mean, it could really vary. I mean, you could just do maybe a typical something like this, but who knows if it may actually, you know, may it come up more, and then this may go down faster, it may scoop up, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to tell, like we can't know, and the difference there can be very important, so we really need to just be careful, right? And so this idea of approximate integration or using these kind of points that we know, these test values to approximate an area, um, becomes very useful to us. And so um, you should be familiar with this concept a little bit. Um, in a chapter four, let's say that I have you know, a curve. Let's see, I'll draw. You know, this is my curve, I don't want to know the area under this. Before we even figure out completely how to evaluate integrals, we had this idea where we would talk about um, you know, inscribing rectangles inside my curve to be able to determine what the area would be from that, right? So this would be an example of, okay, I want to find the area underneath, maybe I'll color it red so you can see it. I want to find the area underneath this red curve. Maybe that's hard to see. Oh, you can see it. Um, and so I'm going to use these rectangles here and where, they, where the right end point hits. Um, to approximate the area of this thing, right? And so we would set up a sum, uh, a Riemann sum, where we would kind of find each of these distances. Let's see, this is all delta x. Maybe it would vary, right? Maybe we would have the same size gap between, and so our rectangles would vary. And so to find, we would approximate the area by taking the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of xi, right? So xi just means whichever x we are at at the current moment, right, as we're going across, and then we multiply by the width of the box at each point, right? We would be adding up these different rectangles to get our area, right? It also happened at points that instead of taking uh, right at points, you know, we would use left at points, and so we would get something, you know, we would be doing like this instead. Uh, So it would be 
right? And then now our sum would change slightly so that instead of plugging in f at xi, we'd be plugging in at the point before it. Okay, and from this, you know, we would also get a sort of approximation. And so you should have done both of these at some point. You should have approximated the area under a curve with rectangles before. Um, but now we want to go a little bit further with this and uh, try to get a better, better uh, approximation or a better answer, right? Because typically what would happen, um, and the book denotes this, and I'll kind of denote it, I'll call this, this is the right in point, so I'll call this uh, R, you know, and I'll call this 3GIL, just like that, okay? What we have is we have a right, have a right in point sum and we'd have a left in point sum and generally what would happen is you'd have one above and you'd have one below right and so the idea would be maybe let's find somewhere in the middle where we can meet and that's exactly what this first method is that we get introduced to where we can you know for you know if we don't want to just use right in points or left in points we can come up with other creative methods to be able to find the area underneath this curve and the way they do it in this case is they, instead of taking a right, right or left endpoint for each of these rectangles, they say, let me take a midpoint of each of these rectangles. We're going to see where that hits my graph, right? So I'm just going to hit the graph here, it hits the graph here, uh, here, and here. And then I'm going to find my area based on the midpoint, like this. And so we would get this area, which hopefully, based on the logic, just what we were talking about, should be a better estimation than both the other ones were, right? So this rule, right, this blue thing that I was just doing here is called midpoint. So instead of taking the left endpoint to approximate the area, or taking the right endpoint to approximate the area, I simply am going to take the midpoint to get my rectangles to approximate the area. And this usually is going to help us to really split this up well, just um, to kind of reach the middle of, the, of that um, upper approximation and lower approximation, really to get it right. And so the general uh, formula for this is going to look like um, if I have an integral, and that's going from a to b uh, of f of x dx, right, where you're given n equals some number, because we're going to have a certain amount of rectangles, right? So a is our starting point, a is this little kind of left side here, and b is our right side, and n is going to be how many rectangles we have. So in this case, it's four, but it could be six, five, you know, it could be really anything, okay? whatever the n is, and the a and the b, then I'm going, this sum, this integral, sorry, is going to be approximated by the sum um, as i equals 1 goes to n of f of x i minus 1 plus x i over 2 and multiply by delta x. Oh, which delta x in this case, actually I'll go ahead and write it. So here's our formula, and we also want to keep in mind x i in each of these cases, right? Just the same as it was here, if you remember those definitions. To get each x i, you take a, and then you add i to it, and then you multiply by delta x. And this is my x i term. And then my delta x term is b minus a all over n. And so this is the midpoint rule. Okay, so this says take your two, kind of each of your endpoints, take the average between them for each rectangle, then plug that into your function, then multiply by delta x, right? So don't worry, we won't just leave it like this. We're going to... Um, you know, kind of work with some examples here, um, practice, and uh, yeah, so let's, let's see, do we want to do an example, or, okay, actually,
actually, it looks like the book, um, what it does is it introduces the midpoint rule and then it's gonna introduce another rule as well. So maybe let's go ahead, uh, hopefully you can still see my picture. I'm gonna see if I can get kind of like a brighter color of some sort so we can distinguish. I'd really like to keep this picture up. Uh, maybe I'll use, maybe I'll use black, the black sheet for this picture for sure. Okay, so, Another rule is introduced right after the midpoint rule, um, which says, why do we have to use rectangles? Why, why should I bother using rectangles, right? Wouldn't it be better if I had it get closer to the curve itself? Why should I just use these blocks? Why can't I kind of shape it to the graph more? And so what it says is, okay, I'm gonna have the same sort of flat face, but instead I'm gonna have the top of the shape go a bit triangular so I can get closer to the curve just like this okay so hopefully you can see that again there we go okay so you can see we formed the shape and this shape um, if you, in case you just want to see what it looks like on the side it looks something like this um, but we know what this is called this is typically called a a trapezoid so a trapezoid is a shape that if you have, basically, you have two sides that are parallel to each other, but then the other two sides are sort of free to go at whatever angle they please, depending on how long the bottom is, but it has four sides. Four sides, two sides are parallel, the other two don't have to be. Okay, we call that a trapezoid. And we're going to go for each of these four here, or in many, you know, in general, we're going to create... Trapezoid. Here's another trapezoid. Maybe something a little more difficult. Maybe this one would just turn out to be more of a rectangle. Another trapezoid. And then finally, here's the last one. Okay, so you can see I'm really trying to take my. Uh, you know, whatever I'm approximating with, and try to fit it to the curve, right? We're going to use these trapezoids to find those areas, right? Now, you may have forgotten what the area of a trapezoid is, um, but that's okay, because I will enlighten you. I will remind you. The area of a trapezoid, in general, is going to be, so let's say um, it has a certain height, um, which I'll call H, and then the length of the bottom is... Uh, we'll call it, uh, sure, we'll, maybe we'll call this B1 on the bottom, we'll call B2 the top. Okay, it doesn't matter where the slant is, we just need to be able to see what the height is of the shape. Then the area of this trapezoid is going to be one half times the height times the base, the sum of the two bases. So that is the area of my trapezoid. Okay, now how does that apply here? Well, maybe we'll make some room. Again, uh, you might want to keep track of that. Remember, we're going to practice with that midpoint rule, so don't worry if you don't completely see it right now. We will. I'll make sure to demonstrate how it works, um, but I'm going to go ahead and erase it for now, give me some room. Well, let's kind of build our case for this trapezoid a little bit, right? So, this trapezoid rule, I'm going to see if I can get a better black and white here. Fantastic. Okay. So I want to take each of these individual trapezoids and add them together, right? Which have varying areas, right? Now this H, right? As long as we're kind of keeping consistent with our delta X, you could have different widths of your boxes. Well, we're going to keep consistent because that's going to be the easiest way to approximate. Okay. So my H in this case is always going to be delta X. Okay. Now let's talk about this B1 and this B2, right? So if I would take what I have here and kind of fit it to this picture, right? This is going to be B2 right here, and then this length would be B1. So with that being said, actually, maybe go back to, there we go. Okay. Uh, or maybe it's delta X. I'm not sure. In any case, it's, you get the idea. Um, so H is delta X, right? Because we want, that's the height of each of our trapezoids. We want that to be the trapezoid. Um, and then when it comes to the sides here, 
right? So we want to kind of understand what B2 and B1 is for each of these trapezoids, right? Well, keep it in mind, right, these points, right, where each of the corners of my trapezoids or rectangles, whichever way you're looking at are, these are each of my XI terms, right? So if I want to get the length of the sides of these trapezoids at, you know, at each of these points, that's simply the Y value of the graph, right? Because this, this curve does touch the original graph, the red graph, which is what we're seeing at this point, but um, the shape is still there, right? So for this first trapezoid, for example, right? This point right here is X zero, and this point right here is X one, right? So B2 in this case, is going to be f of x zero, right? It is my height. So that's the function evaluated at x zero. And then the height at x one is going to be f of x one. Or I guess I should say the base in that case, just depending on which way you're looking at it. So the area of this one, of this first trapezoid essentially, is one half times delta x times f of x zero plus f of x one. Just like that. Now, from here, we ask, well, what's the area of A2 going to be? Right? What's the area of this next trapezoid going to be? Well, this side is the same length as it was on the other trapezoid. So it's going to be, we have 1 half delta x again, but we're going to have f of x1, right? And then we're going to add, we're going to have x, this is going to be x2 right here, right? So my, my height, or the, you know, the length of this base in this case, is going to be f of x2. So I'm going to have f of x1 plus f of x2. And that's going to be the area of that trapezoid. Now you're going to see a pattern here, right? Because we're going to have a3 is going to be 1 half delta x times f of x2 plus f of x3. Right? And then dot, 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 dot. And it's going to keep going until it gets to... So I'll write down the top here until a n, right? The last trapezoid, which is one half delta x, and then this is going to be f of the uh, second to last x, right? Which is x n is the last one, right? Because this is this would be x n if you had four of these, you know. So this is x four in this case, but if you had six trapezoids, it'd be x six. So that's going to be here. That's going to be my last one. But then we're all, we also have f of x n minus 1, right? That's the one that comes right before it, and that gets added to it, just following the pattern here. Okay. So, again, we have this dot, 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 so there's a whole bunch to go between them, right? And now I want to get the total area. So to get the total area, I'm just going to take all of this, and I'm going to add it together. So my area becomes, or my approximate area is going to be, now, all of these have a one-half delta x on it, so I'm going to go ahead and factor that to the outside. Now, I only have one f of x0 here, right? But from then on, I have two f of x1, two f of x2, so I'm going to have two f of x3s, two f of x4s, two f of x5s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to have f of x0 plus two f of x1 plus two f of x2 plus 2f of x3, plus 2f of x4, all the way up, we're going to have 2f of xn minus 1, right? So if I have six trapezoids, then I'm going to have 2f of x5. But then this last side, right, this last edge, only gets kind of twice, once, just like the first one did. So then I'm going to have f of xn. And this right here is what we call the trapezoidal right where again just like last time delta x is going to be b minus a over n and x i equals a plus i on delta x okay so that is uh, my approximation there okay awesome so that's how i can use trapezoids and really get a pretty neat formula to make it all work so, yeah, awesome.
let's go ahead. Uh, I'm going to make some space here because we're going to do an example and I'll kind of write out our rules again just so we make sure we know what we're doing. Right. So and let me write them explicitly um, or, or, or write them in a form that maybe it's a little bit, you know, because I understand the signal notation sometimes can get a little hazy for some people. So I'll kind of write it in a more easier to digest format. So midpoint, midpoint rule. You're going to have a, the area is going to be approximately right for your integral. You're going to have delta x multiplied by f of x o plus x one over two plus f of x one plus x two over two plus dot dot dot. You keep going until you reach f of x n minus one plus x n. Okay, so you evaluate the function at each of these spots, right? You're getting each of the height of these rectangles, and then you're multiplying each of those rectangles by delta x, and that gives us the approximate area. So that is our midpoint rule. Trapezoidal rule is going to be approximately, so I take delta x and I half that, right? Just that half just comes from the area of the trapezoid. And then I'm going to have f of, not this midpoint stuff now, I'm going to have f of x0 again. But then I'm going to have 2f of x1, and then plus 2f of x2, and then dot, 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 all the way up to 2f of xn minus 1, and then plus just 1f of xn as the last one. Okay? So this is my trapezoid rule. Okay? So here's these two rules. Now we're going to use... Um, use these rules to approximate this following um, integral that we're about to calculate here. Okay, so let's do it. Call this example one. Okay, so approximate integral, which is the integral is going to be the integral from one to two of one over x dx using both, and I'll write both of the above rules. Now, um, using our knowledge, we actually can evaluate this integral. We know what it is. It's going to be natural log of x. So you get the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 1. But, of course, um, natural log of 1 is 0. So this exactly is supposed to be natural log of 2. But we're going to come from a point right now, just to kind of test everything, we're going to say, okay, what if I didn't know that? What would I do in that case? Well, we're going to approximate. We're going to use our rules, right? And it says for us to use n equals 5. Okay, so we're going to only going to use 5 rectangles in the case of midpoint and 5, tra five trapezoids in the case of the trapezoidal rule in order to calculate this uh, area. Okay, so let's do it. Uh, we'll start with the midpoint rule first. So we're gonna approximate this using both of the above rules and we're gonna use n equals five, right? Now let's remember, and I'll write this at the top, you really need to make sure to have this known. Xi is gonna be a plus i delta x and delta x is b minus a over n, right? So maybe we'll go ahead and just plug in our numbers into our xi and delta x, right? So we can make our life easier. So delta x is going to be b minus a, right? Which b is 2, a is 1, and then n is going to be 5, so we get 1 fifth. So 1 fifth is our delta x in this case, right? xi is equal to a plus i delta x. We don't know what i is. That's going to vary depending on which, which one we're doing, right? But a is 1. And then we add i and then i times one fifth. Or maybe we'll, we'll do this as 0.2. So each xi is just going to be 1 plus 0.2i. Okay, so whatever i is, we just do 1 plus 0.2, and that's going to be your x, xi. Okay, fantastic. So for midpoint rule, right, we're going to need to know x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Right, because we have n is 5, so we're going to have go from x0 to x5. Okay, 
So let's calculate each to the pound. X to zero is going to be one plus 0.2 times zero, which is one. X one is going to be one plus 0.2 times one, which is 1.2. X two is one plus 0.2 times two, which is 1.4. And you get the gist. X three would be 1.6. X four would be 1.8. And x5 would be 0. Okay, which makes sense, right? We want x0 to be 1, and we want the last point to be the other side. So that should work out good. Okay, so midpoint rule says, so the integral from a 1 to 2 of 1 over x dx is going to be approximately delta x, right, which is 1 fifth, or I'll write 0.2. Now, we need to do f of x O plus x1 over 2, right? So we need to figure out, well, what is xO plus x1 over 2? So that's, so we're going to have f, right, which I'll write f, but f is 1 over x, um, just before we plug it in, right? f of xO, which is 1, plus x1, which is 1.2, and that's all divided by 2. Then we're going to have plus f of 1.2 plus 1.4, divided by 2, right? I'm finding the middle of each of the two values. So between x0 and x1, between x1 and x2, between x2 and x3, between x3 and x4, and between x4 and x5, right? And we're going to keep going like that until we get to the end where we're going to have f of 1, 1. 1.8 plus 2 over 2, okay? So we're going to get 0.2, and then we're going to have f of, well, what's 1 plus 1.2? That's 2.2, and 2.2 divided by 2 is going to be 1.1, and we're going to have plus f of 1.3, plus f of, right, 1.2 plus 1.4 is 2.6, divided by 2 is going to be 1.3, and we'll have f of 1.5, plus f of 1.7, and then if you add this together, you're going to get f of 1.9, okay? So again, it's just, it's, it's midpoint, right? It's the middle of each of the two of your x values, right? Of each pair of x values, right? So now I take these and I plug them into the function and I evaluate it, right? So I'm going to have 0.2 on the outside still, and I'm going to have 1 over 1.1 1 .1 plus 1 over 1.3 1 plus 1 over 1.5 plus 1 over 1.7 plus 1 over 1.9, right? Now feel free, obviously, for this section, you can use your calculator to practice everything. Um, but um, we'll go ahead and just kind of like, you know, kind of skim through this real fast. I'll kind of give the approximation that they provide, um, which is going to end up being approximately 0 0.691908. Okay, which is, is definitely like on the right track, right? Uh, Natural log of 2 is about approximately 6.693, and so this is still a little low, but it's really not that far off. So midpoint rule already is doing a pretty great job of, of approximation, right? So there's that. I'll let you kind of digest that a little bit and think about it for a sec. Um, but then I'm going to move on to um, trapezoidal rule here, but that is midpoint. Okay? If you have questions, you can reach out to me. Let me know. I'm happy to help. Fantastic. So that was midpoint. Now let's talk about trapezoidal rule. So for trapezoidal rule, right, again, I'm going to be using all the same values, so I can just leave all that written down. So 1 over x dx, right, but now I need to take delta x, which we are, right, we are established as 0.2, and we're going to divide that by 2, right, according to this formula. And then I'm going to have f of xo, which is going to be 1. Then we're going to have 2 times f of 1.2, which again, um, if you missed that part um, or, you know, may have forgotten already, just to make sure you understand, um, the reason we're multiplying by 2 is because to get the area of the trapezoid, I have to add um, each side together, but the middle sides of each trapezoid get added twice, right, because for each trapezoid. So that's why we're such a And then we're going to have another 2 for f of 1.4. Another two for f of 1.6, another two for f of 1.8. But when we get to f of to, to x5, right, that's the last one. I do not put a two on it. We stop. So I have f2, okay? 
So your first and your last should not have a two, but every one in between should have a two. Okay. So this one, actually, you don't have to do as many intermediate calculations, but we're going to have 0.1, and that's going to be multiplied by 1 over 1, plus 2 times 1 over 1.2, plus 2 times 1 over 1.4, plus 2 times 1 over 1.6, plus 2 times 1 over 1.8, plus 2 times 1, oh, sorry, plus 1 over Again, feel free to use a calculator to calculate that out, um, but they're going to get their answer to be approximately the value 0 0.695635. Okay, fantastic. Would you look at that? So, still pretty close. This one's actually a bit high, um, interestingly. Um, but it's still relatively close, right? So, you know, we're really working our way there, kind of closing in the value, right? So that's midpoint rule, and that's trapezoidal rule. Um, I really don't want to waste your time um, on this video, so um, I'm not going to try to worry about doing too many, you know, big examples like this. Um, they really all fall, fall through the same way. Um, um, if we have time in class, I might be able to kind of run through one real fast. Um, but otherwise, this is the general idea of what we're doing, of what we're doing, right? So keep that in mind, just practice, um, just really use the formulas, right? The big thing is just the formulas. As long as you just know what to plug in, you should be fine, um, right? And sometimes you might run into problems where um, they may give you no, instead of giving you the graph, they may just give you data points, right? But those data points are just the same as, they're still just these, these function values that I plug in, right? I might need to take averages at some point, um, but otherwise it should be fairly simple. Please do the book examples. I'll encourage you to. Okay, great. Let's do it. Okay, so moving forward, um, I'm going to list just real quick, right? So we just did this problem. Um, and it may be interesting for us to kind of discuss which one was still closer, right? Which one was close enough to the actual value, right? So what we're going to end up finding is we're going to talk about the error, right? So find the error, right, between the actual value and the approximation, right, we're simply going to take, so I'm going to have an error for the midpoint rule, which is going to be the integral minus, and maybe I'll, I'll write this as m, minus m at, for that value, right? So by whatever the midpoint approximation is, maybe I'll write this as d, right? And then the error for the trapezoid rule is going to be I take the integral and then I subtract the approximation for t, right? And so the book gives us that in this case, right, um, that the error for the midpoint rule is going to be um, 0 0.01239. And the error for the trapezoidal rule is going to be negative 0 0.0, oh, sorry, forgot an extra zero. 1, 0, 2, 4, 8, 8. So notice which one's closer. It's actually still the midpoint rule, right? Which you would guess, oh, well, I figured that the trapezoidal rule would be closer. And in some cases, it, it is. But how the midpoint rule functions, right, it's kind of, you know, maybe not putting as much on one side, but putting too much on the other side. It really balances itself out with the rectangles to still work out in some cases. So this is not something where we always use trapezoidal rule and throw it out. But we do want to look at, uh, you know, both of these really think about both of these to see which one's better in each circumstance, right? 
Now, again, this integral, this reference here is, is the integral from 1 to uh, 1 over x dx, okay? which is supposed to be the natural log of 2, which is approximately um, 0 0.693147. Okay, so from that, right, we can still see pretty well how close um, these values are, right? Really, it, it got very close, and it did a very, you know, a great job. It's uh, there's always fine tuning that can be done, but both of these met methods are valuable, so we really want to keep track. Okay, now here's the big thing, right? Here's something that the book kind of gets into. Um, which is, you know, obviously I can, I can make my end bigger. I could do like a hundred trapezoids and I can make the approximation better. Right. So it'd be closer in some way, but maybe we don't need to go that far. Right. Maybe I could just stop at a certain level and be able to say, oh, well, that's good enough. Like this is really, you know, this gets me close enough to the number I want. And so this is all I need. This is all I need to do. Right, um, which is hard to say in some cases, right? Because sometimes, I mean, we don't we don't know how to evaluate these functions, right? We could get the number here, but we can't get the number for all the cases, like the e to the x squared case. So what we do, right, is we need to develop some sort of method to be able to come up with um, maybe bounds for error, right? So maybe I can't calculate this exactly, but I have a general idea of, of how um, big this could be in a given case, right? Um, that I have some sort of judgment, you know, to um, really get close enough, right? So I can say, maybe I kind of clear up what I'm saying, is to say, okay, so maybe, so here's my error bound, right? Or, uh, sorry, here's the number of rectangles or trapezoids that I'm using. And here's kind of the um, different endpoints, right, of the area I'm looking at. Is there some way that I can use that information, you know, and based on the end that I give to kind of have an understanding of what the maximum possible difference is if I use this rule, if I use this rule, right? What is the maximum possible area for error for using? Uh, midpoint rule or for using Travis Witter rule. And eventually, uh, we'll talk about in, in a sec here, is the Simpson rule. Well, there is. And we're going to talk about it. So, there's not really going to be as many problems probably about this. Um, it might still be something interesting to think about or, or practice, but we can actually through proofs and things that um, you don't need to worry about for this class, um, but, you know, it will be interesting just like if you're studying integrals and finding the areas. The error in the midpoint rule between the midpoint rule and the actual function itself, the absolute value of it, right, because we saw that the trapezoidal one was negative, negative, so we want to look at the absolute value. This is going to be less than or equal to k, I'll explain k in a moment, B minus A to the third power over 12 x squared. So through a lot of process, a lot of work to kind of think about these, you know, these issues, we can actually nail down a maximum bound for the error. Right to know, oh, if I use this many ends on this big of an area, right, this big of a section, right, then, um, or use this many rectangles, then this would be a great approximation. And I can know that based on this error calculation, right? Now this K, the way we get this K um, is from knowing, interesting enough, the second derivative. So if you take your function, you take the derivative twice, right? What you want to do to get that k value is you want to know, we 
between A and B, what X value is going to give us the biggest number for the depth over prime of X, right? So let's take a quick example, right? Um, let's say, you know, F, let's say F double prime of X is going to be one over X. Right, and we're going one is less than equal to x is less than equal to two, like from earlier, right? Well, the k value that I would pick is going to be one. Why? Well, this is a function that's going to be decreasing, right? Maybe a little slower like this. Right, here's my two values. This is a function that's going to be decreasing, right? So it's not going to move up in any case. So these two endpoints are really going to be, one's going to be the highest and one's going to be the lowest, right? Which in this case, x equals one gives me the highest value in this range, right? Between one and two. Why? Well, one over one is one, correct? What is one over two? Well, it's one half, or we can call it 0.5, right? Anything else between one and two is going to give us something between one and 0.5, right? But in general, in between one and two, my second derivative, right, this, this function is always less than or equal to the number one, right? So the k value I would use in that case would be one. And so then I would take that and plug it in, and that would give me a, an error bound. So that's very interesting. So I'll leave that there. Um, and then let me write down the one for the trapezoidal rule. And then we can get done with all this discussion when we can move on to the Simpson rule. So E of T, also, if you want to know a bound for this, same way you calculate k the same way, but instead of um, so we still have b minus a the third power over but not 12 n squared, we're gonna have 24 n squared. So notice, oh, I got these flipped. My bad. Uh, this is 24 n squared. Notice they're very close to each other, right? But this one's even slightly better, right? Which again is another reason why it's just fun to kind of practice with these and experiment with them, okay? Again, let me reiterate, a lot of the work you're gonna be doing is just plugging in the numbers and calculate it out, right? But there's a lot that really goes into this that you need to understand as we're moving forward, right? Because I can't just always get an exact answer. I need approximation. Uh, there's gonna be a homework assignment later where I ask a question like why we need approximation in general. So I hope, through a discussion like this, we can, you know, you can really be thinking about this and discussing it, right? Because there are answers we need that we just can't get exactly, right? In, in engineering fields, this happens all the time, right? There's all sorts of motion that we just can't um, really control, right? Or know exactly what's going to happen, right? So we use um, approximation all the time. We just break it up into little pieces like we do with our integrals um, to be able to evaluate it, right? Um, so some real world things can be broken down as easily as an equation. So that's why it's not Okay. Let's move on from this and let's talk about the last rule. So sorry for going on for so long, but I think the discussion is necessary. So, okay, good. I thought that was my initially that's great. Let's pull back our graph. So Simpson's rule is our last approximation we'll be talking about today. And the way that we do this is actually going to be, sorry. Think about this a little bit, just how I'm going to present it. <sighs> so how Simpson's rule works, right? So we have the midpoint rule, you know, and, and the right and the left endpoints that just say, okay, let me just take some flat rectangles on top and approximate this thing. And then you have the trapez, you know, so they're they're coming in there, they're saying, oh, the best method is going to be, you know, just to come up on a, a flat, right? But then trapezoidal rule says, no, 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 no. The best way to come up on it is as a, as a triangle, to try to fit all these different triangles in there. What Simpson's rule does 
is it says no, we gotta put something curvy next to the curve, right? In this case, a parabola. So, we wanna build this, right? Because parabolas are, you know, a pretty basic shape. They're pretty easy to find uh, the area of. So let's do that, right? Why don't, why don't we, let's just take, let's just take a moment, right? Let's just, let's think about this real fast. Um, so the book goes into a little bit of time, a little bit of discussion um, to kind of describe to us you know, if I want to take, I'm going to take three different points. I would say maybe these three or something. And I want to form a, you know, a parabola, right? I want to find something that fits the curve close enough. Okay, I'm going to get this, this sort of black parabola here to match it. Okay. And using this, right, and kind of, Setting up an integral, which you can feel free to read that yourself if you want. Um, again, I feel like I'm already spending a lot of time talking about error bounds. And I kind of want to get to the meat of the issue here. Um, we can find that, again, so we, we want these to be, get, kind of be equally dis distributed, right, uh, between each other. So these are going to be delta x, delta x, or we can call this, the book kind of calls it h here, but I'll leave it as delta x. Okay. If I want to understand the area just of this section underneath, underneath the parabola, right, or the parabola that these three points form, right, so I'll just, I'll really highlight this section here. So this is what we're talking about here, this section of the parabola. Then this area is approximately going to be, I take delta x, and I'm going to divide it by three, right? Now, if you're wondering why by three, why does that make sense? Well. Remember when I integrate x squared, we get one third x cubed, right? And that's exactly what, the, there's the one third, right? Now, this area is gonna be a, a delta x over three, and then we're gonna take f of x zero plus four, which, or maybe I'll say, uh, no, I'll do, I will do, f of x0, let's say, so we'll say this is x0, we'll call this x1, and we'll call this x2. Okay, so we have f of x0, then we're going to add plus 4 f of x1, and then plus f of x2. And if this seems weird, um, I understand, it does look kind of kind of funny, but this is very solid. Again, read read the book. If you want me to work it out for you, I'd, be, I'd love to. Um, I do think this is very interesting stuff, so here we go. This is an approximation of the area underneath. Well, this is an exact um, area underneath the parabola, right? But of course, in this case, it's an approximation for the area of the curve, right? But we don't stop, right, at just three points, right? We want to do a bigger section, right? So I'm going to call this, right? So this is going to be my first area here. Uh, we'll call this A1, right? then you're going to have A2, which is going to take three more points, right? But these three points are not going to be, are not going to include X0 and X1 now, right? Because those, those were a part of that first section. We're going to move on to the next section, which is going to have X2, or F of X3, and F of X4. We're going to go to the next section with x4, x5, x6, and the next section, which has um, x6, x7, x8, until we get to the last section, which I, I don't know, I'll call this a, I'll call it AL for now, just to, because how it's spread out is a little weird, but um, the last area, which is going to be delta x over 3, and then this is going to be f of x in minus 2 plus 4 times f of x in minus 1 plus f of x in. Okay, so again, let me break this down, right? So we can just make sure we know what's happening. I've taken my curve and I've said, okay, I'm gonna take this point, 
this point and this point. Maybe I'll do another, uh, make it a little longer. So I'm pretty sure that's this point. Okay. I'm going to take this point, this point, and this point. I'm going to make a parabola out of it. And I'm going to approximate the area underneath, or I'm going to find the area underneath the parabola that's formed between those points, which is this. Then you take the next three points and you say, okay, I'm going to take this point, this point, which is the same as the point here, this point, and this point. I'm going to see what the parabola looks like that they form. And then I'm going to find the area underneath that section. And you move on, you say, okay, let me form another parabola and let me find the area underneath that section and underneath this section and that section and that section. So many sections. <laughs> so all together, right? We want to, so we want to take all that and add it up, right? Now that we have all these different parabola pieces and we're going to put them together, right? Notice f of x zero and f of x are still by themselves. f of x one, x three, x five, x seven, x nine, all of them are going to have four. But all of the even terms besides 0 and xn, n needs to be even here. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, just, just for this rule, uh, the other ones can't be odd or even, but this one has to be even. Um, so something to write down, potentially. Um, this is for Simpson's rule. Each of the even ones besides 0 and n are going to be added twice together, right? Because I have x2 and x2, x4 and x4 x6 and x6, and then we're going to have xn minus 2, xn minus 2, etc., all the way until the end. So when I smush all of that together, my area, which maybe we'll denote by s now, right, Simpson's rule, is going to be approximately delta x over 3, right, to, to get that on the outside, and then we're going to have f of xo plus 4 f of x1 plus 2 f of x2, plus 4 f of x3, plus 2 f of x4, right? And then it goes all the way up until, okay, so we're going to 2 f of x in minus 2, plus 4 f of x in minus 1, and then plus f x in. And this is the same sentence. So we're left with this. Okay, there we go. Simpson's rule. Okay, so that's how it's built. That's where it comes from. Um, now let's use it. You want to practice using it real quick? Let's do it. Okay, fantastic. So we are going to again, you know, let's just kind of finish off strong with what we started with. We're going to calculate the area from one to two of natural or one over x. <laughs> dx, and we're going to approximate that using um, Simpson's rule, but in this case, we're going to use n equals 6, because we need an even number, so let's just go to the next one, right? So, we are going to have, right, so this is going to be approximately delta x over 3, which now delta x, right, so maybe let's pull out the calculator once again. So this is going to be b minus a, 2 minus 1, over n, which is 6. So we're going to have 1 sixth. Okay, fantastic. Actually, I think maybe instead of n equals 6, I'll use the book. Looks like it uses 10. Maybe that'll make life a little bit easier. How about that? <laughs> okay. So we're going to have 0. 0.1 here. Okay. So we're going to get delta x is equal to 0. 0.1. So we'll use 10. n equals 10. It's an even number, so it still works. And that just makes the calculations a little less sticky. Okay xi, right, it's going to be a plus i delta x, so it's going to be 1 plus i times 0.1, or 1 plus 0.1, right? So, x0 is going to be 1, x1 is going to be 1.1, and x2 is going to be 1.2, etc., etc. We're going to have x9 x, uh, is going to be 1.9, and then f again, right, just following. Okay, so our area is going to be approximately delta x over 3. So we're going to have 0 0.1 over 3. And we're going to take f of 1 
plus four half of 1.1 plus two half of 1.2 plus four half of 1.3 plus two half of 1.4 plus four half of 1.5 plus two half of 1.6 plus four half of 1.7 plus two half of 1.8 plus four half of 1.9 and then plus half of Just like that. Okay, so again, we have one, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, and we have okay. So then we plug all that into a calculator, right? We're gonna have one over one, one over one point one, one over one point two, etc. And that's gonna leave us with an approximation of zero point six nine three. 0 0.693150, right? Which again, a lot better. Um, if this is this is even better than Travers uh, midpoint. Now you might say, oh well, that's just because they didn't get the they had smaller numbers, right? And then you just made that too easy to calculate. Um, you know, they, they might do better, and that's very true. It, it could very possibly happen. Now Simpson's rule does have a habit that it's it's usually a lot better than these two are, um, but you know, I mean, they're still all valid, right? This one just especially does very good, right? It really just takes kind of the best of the both of both worlds here in this case um, to make this the best. Okay, so again, just formulas. Really know these three formulas. If you know these, you're going to be golden. Um, there's been a lot of discussion now, and I just think it's important. That's why I'm talking all this. Sorry about all my talking. Uh, my voice is going out. Uh, but I just really need to make sure you get the picture here. You need, you need to make sure what's happening, what's going on, why all this is working, okay? But formula is what we do, okay? Fantastic. Um, and one last thing to mention is that um, Simpsons also has an error, right? Which you can just subtract the two and it rolls to kind of see what the difference is. Um, but also, if you don't know, then we have an error bound for Simpsons which is going to be less than or equal to, and then this is going to be K times B minus A. Now this is to the fifth power over 180 into the fourth. So notice these numbers are bigger. This is actually significantly. Uh, you can tell that there's a decrease of a, a smaller capacity on this error here. Which is very interesting um, to work out. Um, for any of you and you know interested in doing further math, I would encourage it. I think there's a really a lot that goes on behind this. It's very cool um, of how it functions and how we get these, you know, these error bounds and this sort of thing. Um, but this is the error for the Simpsons. Um, but this K is different. This K is the upper, is, is the highest that, not the second derivative could be, but the fourth derivative could be. Wow. And, and of course, this is between A and B. Yep. Now you're sitting there like, who comes up with this stuff? Where are they getting all this from? Okay, so there's our error, okay? So if you want to practice with the error a little bit more, practice other examples, please read the book. Um, do the problems assigned, um, you know, you can probably get a little bit of experience there, but um, just a little bit of exposure where you see that uh, kind of play around with this. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for watching that. Um, sorry if it went on for a while. Um, I hope you're able to glean something from it. Um, again, boom, 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 know these three, that's the big idea. Um, I think I do ask about error on the homework, but it's mostly just, you can find it, just subtract from it and tell me, right? So I'm just looking for, you, uh, in each case, right? I, I want, um, so the actual integral minus the midpoint approximation actually 
actual integral minus the trapezoidal approximation, and then the actual integral. And maybe we'll maybe I want the absolute value, um, you know, because we're more interested in just the distance and not really the sign as much. Although, well, maybe no, it would be cool. It would be cool, I think, to see you know which side it's on. That would be an interesting discussion to think about. Um, we're going to have a to b, and that's going to be f of x. We have the x is going to all be um, minus x. Okay, so that's all mass. You just find the difference between the two integrals and just between the actual value and the midpoint, actual value, and the trapezoid, actual value, and Simpsons, and just kind of see how they compare with each other because I think you'll get some interesting results from it. So. Okay, great. Know these, work with them, practice it, really pull them in, and that should be good. So. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great um, whatever time of day you're watching this.